All right, last video, another 15 minutes. As you can tell, all the videos are 15 minutes, so this one will be 15 minutes too. Um, look, one question I've just been thinking that may appear in the year this year. The RBA's done nothing this year. The RBA stayed at cash rate at 1.5%. So there's a chance that they might sort of focus on that ability to analyse why the RBA has kept their rate at 1.5%. And because they've done nothing and not increased or decreased, you need to take a really a balanced approach to this question. So in terms of the overall economy in 2018, it's important that you recognise factors that are both increasing and decreasing um, inflation as well as the other objectives of the Charter. So for example, you know, there are certain reasons telling the RBA to loosen monetary policy this year. Um, that includes you know, inflation still quite weak, so they can there's still scope for them to be more expansionary, still got slow wage growth, um, and spare capacity in the labour market, and um, there's also that desire to promote the other objectives within the Charter, even though we've just suddenly got slightly within the range. Um, from a tightening perspective, um, again, house prices remain relatively high, so they don't want to loosen monetary policy further because that can lead to um, house prices increasing. Having, having said that, in the last sort of six months as house prices have started to fall, that's probably less relevant. Um, but there's also other factors that are preventing them from tightening. So all these things like the depreciating dollar, strong overseas growth, the pickup in confidence, falling unemployment levels, they're all signs that potentially the RBA could move to a, a tightening of monetary policy because they all show that the economy is picking up and some inflationary pressures um, might um, start to um, emerge coming forward. So there's some things you could focus on there in terms of, all right, what are the reasons why they might continue to loosen? And they're your, sort of your key factors. What are some reasons why they haven't loosened or why they might tighten? And then you have a balanced approach to take into account all these factors that the RBA has kept the cash rate the same and basically done nothing. Other random points. Something I've noticed with questions, if you get a relative price question, so for example, explain how an excise tax on alcohol reallocates resources. A lot of people are saying that, that increases the price of alcohol and therefore producers have to pay higher production costs and therefore they shift resources into other areas and that promotes efficiency because less people are drinking so there's less binge drinking and violence and drink driving and things like that. The thing that I'm not seeing is answers, in answers is that link to consumption. So when you get a question on taxes, particularly if it's alcohol taxes or excise taxes on tobacco or cigarettes, make it really clear that that increase in price then leads to a contraction in demand. It's more efficient. When you're linking it to efficiency, you need to state really clearly that, I mean, at a simple level, less people are smoking, less people are drinking, and the reason for that is because the price is higher. So when you're getting these questions, make sure you really clearly articulate that these taxes increase the relative price of products, and that leads to a contraction in demand, and that's what makes it more efficient because we stop having these issues with binge drinking and violence and things like that. Um, just another thing with cigarettes, if you're looking for a demand or supply side factor impacting cigarettes, there was a report now that something like um, 18 to 20 year olds are thinking that cigarettes is a little less cool than ever, um, smoking cigarettes. So that's just a demand side factor looking at changes in um, consumer preferences. Other forms of government intervention, make sure you're aware of subsidies, government regulations and advertising. Again, if you get a question on subsidies, talk about how that helps to lower the relative price of certain products and actually encourages consumption of goods that have positive externalities. Um, on a completely different note, when you get asked for reasons for taxation reforms, the main reason why the government has to implement taxation reforms at the moment is um, they want to replace indirect taxes with, sorry, that should be replaced direct with indirect. So they're trying to encourage getting taxes off company and income taxes so they can promote participation and investment and putting them into more indirect taxes that don't have the same negative impacts for efficiency. They want to promote foreign investment. Um, they want to encourage participation. So they're all reasons why we are implementing taxation reforms at the moment um, going forward because um, we want to promote a more effective and stronger economy going forward. Other things, don't use, overuse open market operations. If a question asks you, for example, you know, explain how the RBA might respond during a trough, um, it's, it's more a question of sort of why they would do that in terms of increasing inflation, increasing growth and employment, rather than talking about the impacts of open market operations. Um, another question you may get, I'll ignore that because I've talked about that more in the slides, just be aware of the merits of market versus interventionist approaches. Uh, one doesn't cost the government money, but it can hurt efficiency, so market economy intervention. Other things like interventionists, like education, infrastructure, etc. Fiscal consolidation, if you get asked how that provides an environment conducive to investment, basically what they're saying with that is that by preserving, um, getting the budget back to surplus, we can avoid sort of future increases in taxes. 
and that can help to provide an environment where they're able to give income and company tax cuts going forward, which can be conducive to more investment in the future. Um, grants include tax concessions, accelerate depreciation allowances. So if you do get a question that mentions grants, feel free to talk about all those things we've talked about. Um, if you get a question about supply-side budgetary policies, don't talk about trade, live or immigration. They're not examples of supply-side policies. Uh, they're not examples of budgetary policy. They are examples of supply-side policies. With the terms fiscal consolidation and the medium-term strategy, again, these are important concepts leading into your exam. Fiscal consolidation is basically a bit shorter. It's just the commitment to return the budget to surplus by 2021 and by doing that by increasing revenues and decreasing expenditure. The medium term fiscal strategy's got a little bit more to it. Basically they want to run surpluses on average over the course of the business cycle. Um, that's what the medium term fiscal strategy is at a core level. But it also includes a range of other things. Um, they want to redirect investment to quality investment. So what that means is they want to make sure that all expenditure is, is involved in quality investment that's going to boost productivity and participation going forward. Um, they want to ensure strong fiscal discipline, which will then free up resources for private investment, which means that in the future they can in have an environment that's conducive to private investment by repaying government finances at the moment, or repaying government debt, sorry. And then other things like increasing government revenue and improving our net financial worth are other factors. So if you do get a question on medium term fiscal strategy, it would be good, good to have a couple of other things to talk about just besides running surpluses on average. Talk about all these other benefits it creates in terms of investment and um, freeing up investment and ensuring that investment is being used in quality areas. All right, just one thing. Look, I'm not going to go through this in detail, but just be mindful with the capital account. Um, the current account, exports and imports, education, tourism, etc., income, so all dividends, profits, rent, and then gifts. Just with foreign aid, um, most foreign aid will be recorded in the current account. The only time you may see it in the capital account, and this is what was on the Insight paper, um, if it's designed for infrastructure for other countries, just know that it's a capital account transaction. So if it's for roads or bridges or anything like that. Um, migrant transfers, so migrants moving countries can also be in the capital account. And any intellectual thing to do with intellectual property. Look, if I've looked at 15 years worth of exams and there's been never any questions on the capital account, but just in case, migrant transfers, royalties and grants um, or basically foreign aid if it's related specifically to infrastructure for other countries. If it doesn't say infrastructure in the question, still treat it as net secondary income. Um, and again, if you only get the choice between financial and current account, foreign aid will always be a current account transaction if that helps as well. In terms of the financial account, basically any setting up of new assets overseas, so direct investment, Portfolio investment, selling and purchasing shares, um, all debt transactions, so borrowing between nations, and then basically all these complex stuff, again, very rarely or if never gets tested, but if you do see some foreign uh, complex financial transaction, it's probably in the financial account in case it's a multiple choice question, but overall I wouldn't be worried about that. All right, just one other thing. With common access resources, it's really important that you can make that link to common access resources and negative externalities. They have very similar characteristics. Common access resources are non-excludable and rivalrous and what ha often happens is when we do things that have negative externalities, so for example pollution in the air destroys the common access resource. So clean air or a stable climate is our common access resource and um, that can be destroyed by negative externalities, for example pollution which imposes a third party cost on other parties, in this case reducing the quality of clean air and that can um, destroy our common access resource. If you do get a question on your exam asking you to link um, how the government intervenes to um, prevent common access resources or, um, oh, or the overuse of over common access resources, you can talk about the excise tax on, um, sorry, the carbon tax and how that helps to preserve our climate which then maintains a stable climate going forward and that's a positive um, for the environment as well. I'm not going to go through that. Um, here's just two questions on common access resources. So fish is an example. It's not excludable. Um, and it's rivalrous in the sense that nobody has property rights, try and use that term. And then basically try and use that idea there's an absence of price signals. So prices don't increase when there's more demand, so therefore people acting in their own self-interest are likely to overuse these common access resources. That can hurt third parties because we overuse them in current, future, in current time and therefore they're not available for future generations. So try and use those words, um, property rights, price signals and things like that. Um, and other things you might want to talk about is that for government intervention, so for the ozone layer for example, um, that leads to UV rays and it's rivalrous because we've only got one and if we overuse it it's not available for others and then people get sunburn, people get diseases. 
Um, the government can intervene through banning chlorofluorocarbons. I think that's how you say it. Um, and then that can lead to protectioning of the, the protecting the ozone layer. Um, here's just one little thing you might say as a summary for evaluation questions. So in recent times, monetary policy has been forced to play a more active role in stimulating employment, given the constraints of budgetary policy and fiscal consolidation. However, we are starting to see a drop in the deficit. Um, budgetary policy may take a more active role going forward if they are able to preserve their finances and the economy is going well. So that may be a sign that you could, so some sort of statement you could use if you want to pause this screen and use that as a summary for evaluation questions because it can be quite tricky. Um, if you get a question about fiscal consolidation, make sure you link it back to the, you know, if the deficit's getting smaller like ours are now, that shows commitment to reducing the size of the deficit. If this pattern is to continue, we're likely to see surpluses by 2021, which would be consistent with the government's medium term strategy. Um, when you're doing markets, free market questions, just more broadly, um, I'm not going to be able to have time to go through Uber and stuff like that in this example, but make sure that you're linking it to the fact that if the market's more competitive or free, they're more technically efficient because they have more incentive to invest in new technology and capital. Make sure you include that in your answers. Um, unlike when less competitive markets where they might be able to restrict supply, they always produce in the correct quantities so they don't have shortages or surpluses. Um, there's also more choice in competitive markets compared to when markets are less free. Um, there's got low barriers to entry, unlike in a comp um, less competitive market where there are high barriers to entry which makes it harder for people to join the industry. Again, that makes them more dynamically efficient. Consumer sovereignty is not always achieved in a less competitive market and is in a free market. They're less likely to engage in collusion and other sort of um, activities where they work together to reduce, increase prices. So in can, when you're doing free markets and technical and allocative efficiency, make sure for technical efficiency you link it to the incentive to invest because there's high levels of competition. For allocative efficiency, you link it to the, how they're responsive to price signals and therefore they can quickly increase supply to meet consumers' demands and people get what they want in the correct quantities. So I'm going to skip through some of these questions in relation to free and competitive markets. I'll send you the slides and you can use them as well. The last thing I wanted to cover on this video was trade liberalisation and the goals. Okay, there are key things you want to touch on for each goal um, and it probably didn't come across as well as I would have liked in the last question in the um, 2017 exam. So I just wanted to touch on some key things you can talk about for the last thing in this video. So in relation to low inflation, trade liberalisation has to help to reduce cost push inflation. Some reasons for that is that it encourages to shift resources out of inefficient industries and into areas where we're more efficient. Um, one thing that it encourages firms to do that you can link to low inflation is it encourages them to restructure. So the increase in competition forces them to restructure, to try and cut their production costs, um, and that can help to low inflation. This increase in productivity, because we're now working more productively, can help to lower prices and therefore lead to lower um, increased market share. It also allows companies to take advantage of larger markets abroad so they can produce on a grander scale and take advantage of economies of scale. Um, this is another key thing for inflation. Basically, trade liberalisation gives us access to raw materials from overseas and capital from overseas at a cheaper price. So the fact that we can import stuff directly, which re directly reduces the CPI. So the key things you want to talk about here is, one, we get access to cheaper materials, reduce our cost of production. Two, it leads to lower prices because there's more competition and we restructure. And three, we be benefit from economies of scale. And then define the goal. In terms of strong and sustainable growth, define the goal. Make sure you really clear that it encourages us to specialise and therefore we boost our productive capacity by producing what we're good at. Again, it encourages businesses to reorganise and restructure. Um, make it clear that it can lead to more um, a less growth in the short term because we might face more competition. But the, in the long term, the increased access to equipment, the restructuring of businesses, um, and this one here, it gives us access to bigger export markets. That's one of the key things associated with trade liberalisation. Trade liberalisation promotes jobs and employment and growth because it gives us access to export markets overseas. Um, that leads to higher national incomes. So link it to the negative impacts in the short term because we may have to restructure and close down. But in the long term, we reorganise, we shift resources to areas of comparative advantage, we get access to largest markets overseas. Um, and it encourages us to restructure to make us more internationally competitive. Really quickly, because I'm running out of time, full employment. Short term, it can hurt more structural unemployment. Long term, we're more flexible and efficient. We reallocate resources to areas of comparative advantage, critically important. Businesses restructure. Um, it also gives us access to bigger markets overseas. We also get access to costs, um, equipment and materials from overseas. 
that all leads to us being more internationally competitive because